This is the StoryWorks Roundtable, where we have conversations about craft. Because becoming a successful author begins with writing a great story. Happy New Year. And to help us shove out 2020 and ring in 2021, we have a special double episode for you today. Beth Barani walks Robert and me through her author's statement of purpose. There was no way to break this episode into two and make it a two-parter because it is a practicum. It is a workshop. Get your paper. Do it with us. You won't regret it. I am super excited at the statement that I came up with as a result of going through this exercise with Beth. It is a lot of things. It is the definition of what you write. It helps you figure out why you write it, what you are obsessed with. And it's that nutshell statement you can deliver on an escalator, as Beth says, because an elevator ride is longer than this statement. It's something you can use as a tagline. You can put it on your website, on your business card, uh, in your query letters, or on the back cover of your books, your sales pages. This is at least a three-in-one win-win-win for all of us. So grab your notebook, get a cup of coffee, and write along with us. And with that, I hope 2021 is the best writing year any of us has ever had. All right, Happy New Year's, and I will see you on the other side. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to this week's StoryWorks Roundtable. Robert and I are thrilled to be joined once again by Beth Barani. Award-winning novelist Beth Barani writes magical tales of romance, mystery, and adventure that empower women and girls to be the heroes of their own lives. She is the award-winning author of Henrietta the Dragon Slayer, the acclaimed paranormal romance author of the Touchstone series, and is proud to release her newest novels, science fiction mysteries about Janie McAllister, Space Station Investigator. Welcome back to the roundtable, Beth. So glad to see you again. Thank you, Lita. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Happy to be here. Great. So we are having you on to talk about the author's statement of purpose, timing it with the new year intentionally, because what better way to end 2020, the uh, great disappointment that it has been for so many of us, <laughs> and to usher in a new year, then through a process of self-reflection, self, uh, I don't know, I, assessment isn't the right word, I want to say like identification, you tell us, tell us about the author's statement of purpose, because I think it's going to help us launch 2021 in great ways. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And thanks for that introduction. Yes. Um, so I used to call this statement the clear message. Uh, and now I'm calling it the author branding statement. And it's really designed to answer that question that people might ask you when they find out that you're a writer. They're going to say, oh, really? What do you write? And they're going to lean in, either physically <laughs> or across the internet waves, right? And and it, we want to... We want to draw them in or bounce them away. We want them to be a hard yes or a hard no. And it's really all about attracting your readers at the end of the day and attracting your allies and your, you know, people who will be interested and tell other people about you because they might not be your core readers, but they may know who they may have people in their lives who are your, your readers. And so really this game is designed to generate excitement and curiosity and attract readers to you so that you can sell books so that you can have an author career because that's why we write right we write to be read yes. we write to share our <laughs> yes a hard yes yes we write to be read we write to share a message to bring our stories out into the world and we need an audience i need an audience you need an audience yes absolutely um, so, and yeah. you know if we can get 
clear on this statement that is going to attract the core readers, that is going to generate that hard yes or that hard no, it can really help us shape our plan for the year, help us decide what kind of novels we actually want to write and, you know, which projects to start. So, yeah, tell us more. Yeah, I just wanted to interject that, but tell us more. Yeah, I I hadn't really thought about that. I totally think of this as a marketing tool to attract readers. But if you're just starting out, then it, it can really get you excited when you know what you're really what you stand for as an author and what you're really up to, it can be so motivating to help you go forward. Or maybe you have an idea to write something in a new genre or for something for the first time. You can try the statement and it can be your North Star. It can be, you know, help you get there. Um, And if you already have a body of work, it can help you make sense of that body of work in terms of like, what is the overarching theme? Um, Or if you write in multiple genres, you can even craft one per genre and then look at, oh, okay, what's the umbrella theme here? Um, So uh, you could go either way, although for simplicity's sake, I really Mm -hmm. invite you to just pick one genre if you write in multiple genres. And this is going to help you if you write fiction or nonfiction, or of course, or both, like a lot of us do. Yeah, and it it can really inspire you, motivate you, but also help you take some action Mm -hmm. around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think taking action is something, I guess I won't speak for, I won't generalize here, but for me personally, feeling the need to take action is a driver going into this new year, especially after all of the plans that were interrupted, events that were canceled, all of the travel plans that had to be, you know, foregone and being stuck at home. And I think, Frustration is probably one of the themes of of 2020, <laughs> disappointment. And so any tool that can help us um, identify our core themes as a writer, our, you know, core subject matter or primary genre or who our ideal readers are can really help us to go forward. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm all for getting clear on these things. And also it it can morph and it can change. And so once you learn how to write your author branding statement, you can revisit it anytime you want. You can, I often revise it, especially when I teach it. I'm like, Hmm, now that I've said it 5 million times, I think I want to change it. You know? (laughs) Right. Um, Yeah. Yeah. The idea of the North star is intriguing. Do you have any more to say about that or how have you used your author statement as a North star? Yeah, it really helped me encapsulate um, what I was up to. And over the years, it has stood the test of time. And it's really reminded me like, oh, I'm, I don't, you read, you're listening, you heard it. And Lolita, you said it in my bio, you know, I am all about empowerment. And when I write fiction, I'm all about empowerment for women and girls. And I've written three series now and that keeps coming back so it's like oh yeah I really am about that I really care about that and it shows up in other ways of my life I have adjacent projects I want to do a woman warrior project I'm like ooh, it's still there I mean I got like um, eight books over there <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like yeah this is this is for real so it's like doing this statement helps you go yeah that's for real and I've played with other versions of my statement um like escape to worlds where anything is possible. Oh, oh, that sounds like empowerment, (laughs) you know? So, and then of course it shows up in other parts of my life as a writing teacher. I'm all about empowerment. Like, Hey guys, let me give you the tools so you can go fish. I'm not going to just provide you the fish. Here's the fishing equipment and here's the how to's and let's go play and let's practice. So Mm -hmm. I realized that ever since I really started, stepped into what I stood for, this empowerment is just, Boom. It keeps showing up. I'm like, okay, it's for real. So it's like, it, it reminds me. And so when I forget what I'm up to, and then I remember my statement, and I remember how empowerment is my word, and then I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How can I power, empower myself today? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it, you know, it helps me, and it helps I'm helping others. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's really stood the test of time. And so once you get clear on this, you might notice that it's not new to you. You're like, duh, of course. 
But right. what's wonderful about it is now you can share it with others in a way that that will hopefully will generate curiosity, which mm-hmm. I learned in my sales training is, is our trainers taught it us that it was the first stage of sales. Um, and it's like the appetizer, right? You walk into the store, they're like, try our new jam, you know, <laughs> and you try it. You're like, hmm, I haven't had that coming blueberry and raspberry before. I'll get some, you know, but it, this allows people to try you out in that one beautiful sentence. Mm-hmm. So, That's awesome. I love, too, that you've got Wonder Woman, <laughs> yeah, yeah. icon of yeah. feminine it's empowerment true. over your shoulder there. <laughs> That's right. I also have Princess Leia and Daredevil. I mean, not Daredevil, but um, Black Widow. Uh, and there's one more. I don't have Crap- Captain Marvel yet. Um, I have to look behind myself. Oh, yeah, Ray, of course, Ray from Star Wars. Uh, so nice. yeah. yeah, it's interesting that there's so much behind what you just said because you've obviously you're obviously dealing with um, your own author statement, call it whatever branding statement that's been crystallized and distilled over many many years. That, that you it's clearly a home place for you when you you re-anchoring yourself with it. It's quite clearly even just the word. For many, it could sound like well, that's just a log line. But obviously, listening to you, it's much deeper than that. So it's like the iceberg. It's the bit that sticks out the top. But underpinning that, there's this massive, solid, strong identity. So for somebody who's not played with this before, who's new to it, whether they're an experienced author or just new, where do you, how do you help them start? Well, how do you help them start thinking about what is going to be their author statement? You know, what sort of things should they be asking themselves or, or, or how do you approach that in general? That's great. Yeah, absolutely. So there's four pieces. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. That was on. <laughs> okay. So there's, there's four pieces. Um, <laughs> there are four pieces to the author branding statement. Right. And I'm going to, um, I'll lead you guys through each one, and you can play along, both of you, yeah. and those yeah, of you yeah. at home, play along too, because by the time we're done, I'm hoping that we'll, we will go through all four pieces, and I'm going to invite everybody to craft their own sentence, and then there is a way that you can share your sentence with me, um, and I can give you feedback afterwards, after the podcast. Um, Excellent. And with so- you guys live... Yeah, and everybody listening, great place to pause and grab your notebook and pencil because it's not just theory today, it is practice. <laughs> yes, we love practice. We Two do. Two arms up and the Wonder Woman comes for practice. <laughs> yeah. You only get one page at a first impression. If you don't nail your opening, your reader won't commit to your story. In any genre, any style. The writer's first objective is to capture the reader's attention. Will it be an action-adventure explosion? A rom-com heartwarming introduction to the lovers? A literary, contemplative, subtly tense drawing of character? No matter what kind of story you're writing, you only get one chance to make a first impression on your reader. It has to go beyond good way beyond, to turn that impression into commitment. Because that's what we're asking of our readers, to commit their time and attention to our stories, to devote their hearts to our characters, to invest their excitement to the push, pull, and every twist of our plots. Write Great Openings is a new live workshop open for enrollment now. This is a writing and workshopping intensive course, so bring a draft of your work in progress. Enroll today at storyworksfiction.com to ensure your story makes a powerful first impression. And, um, and, and both for you, Alita and Robert, you are totally invited to play with this. Maybe you've done it before, maybe not. And we can workshop it right together because this is so excellent. Yeah, I have learned in doing online summits and stuff that people love to see me work these on the people interviewing me because Mm -hmm. it is such a wonderful learning process for everybody. 
because this is not like um, you craft it and boom, you're done. It's kind of like you, it's first draft, second draft, yeah. third draft, just the way we do with our books. So there's a real playfulness here and experimentation and kind of finding the edges and playing and getting feedback. That's mm -hmm. the best part about this is doing it live and getting immediate feedback. Um, and when I do live workshops online and in person, I'm like, yeah, come on, share me your state. After we go through everything, we share and we can all notice what really lights us up and what is kind of like, huh? And what is like a dud or whatever. And everybody's going to have their own response. So right. it's beautiful. Right. And can I just interject? The yeah. reason I asked you to be on the show is because one of my editing clients took one of your one of those workshops you just mentioned and um, had such a great experience she recommended you to me and so I want to give a shout out to Madeline who and just point out to everybody listening that hey if you have recommendations for show guests we listen <laughs> send an email <laughs> that's so wonderful oh that's so wonderful yeah that's such I think I know which one you're talking about I think it was Brian Bernie yes. author marketing summit i think it called it yes yeah yep. yeah it was so the brian fun. bernie one uh-huh yeah that's great yes great wonderful thank you so much for that recommendation um all right shall we get started yes yeah. we're ready okay number one number one is your genre your genre and what does that mean so in today's world in fiction when we speak of genre usually we're talking about where that book how that book is categorized and where it lives in the in the bookshelf or you know online category and we might be calling it romance right or or science fiction or history or women's fiction or historical fiction or i think everyone will be familiar with these terms um and then i'm going to invite each of you and everybody listening to see if you can drill down a little bit so sure you can say romance and I, I've been part of the romance writing community for a long time. And, and that, as every reader in romance will know, that is often not enough. Because if you ask a, a reader who loves romance, they're going to say, well, I love small town romance. Or I love, uh, gosh, there's a trope, what is it? Um, secret baby romance. I've met people who are like, oh, I love secret baby romance. <laughs> or I, I love, you know, I have some friends who write um romantic um who write romance for people for their protagonists are over 50. so they there's there's some term i can't remember what it is right now developing or they write sci-fi romance or they write paranormal or like i'm working on some paranormal romantic suspense so um i'm more specific there right um or maybe you write a mashup like i'm writing sci-fi mystery well that's a genre that's just up and coming and i had to do some research and figure out is this the right thing do i really call it this um or i could call it sci-fi romance with romantic uh, sci-fi mystery with romantic elements so see if you can get specific um and you can be off the wall like my husband writes thrillers um and we used to say that he wrote Jewish thrillers. Now we say he writes hard-boiled kosher thrillers. <laughs> <laughs> I like or that. Back to that reaction, right? <laughs> right. Funny. This stuff is funny. So if you have humor in your books and that's a big component, maybe you can do something like that, right? So I'm going to pause here and check in with you both. If you feel comfortable, hopefully you do, since you're there, you're, you're the podcasters. Tell me what your genre is. Robert, what, what's yours? Yeah, um, mine would be action-adventure with twists in a futuristic setting. Yes, wonderful. And for the purpose, eventually, of wordsmithing, you might want to shorten that and move some yes. things around so it's a little shorter. But I love first drafting it. Yes, I, I know exactly what you're doing. And I like that kind of stuff, too. Wonderful. Very good. And how, how about you, Alita? Okay, well, literary, historical, uh, slash, or maybe instead of that, Midwestern Gothic, I guess that doesn't get it historical. So, uh, yeah, historical and Midwestern Gothic tales. Yeah, I okay. like that. Yeah. You've done something <laughs> unusual there that really got me interested. So Midwestern historical 
gothic. gothic. Yes. Literary tales. Fun. And you know, both of you came up with things that are a little bit, they aren't like the standard way we describe a genre, but yet no. they are very clear and very specific and interesting. Readers are going to go, woo. Especially there's that, I haven't heard of that before, right? Because readers are always looking for the same but different. Yes. So you both have combined yes. things that we all understand, and then you've done something different with them. Like, oh, so <laughs> awesome. Um, Gold great, star good for us. Gold star. <laughs> right. And all you listening at home, gold stars. All right. So that's number one. Number yep. two is readers. Who are your readers? Now, at the end, when we were finished with the statement, we may take this out, but sometimes we might leave it in, depending. Um, the mundane example is when you say, for romance writers, asking who their readers are, they're like, well, women, <laughs> you know? And it's kind of like built into the genre. We all, like 90% of the readership of romance is women. Men do read it, but they're a small minority. So, but maybe um, you want you you, the author, has a specific kind of audience in mind. And you may know, like, um, and how do you, so think of your audience in two kind of ways. First start maybe with the mundane demographic way of men or women or teens or kids or girls or women, or, you know, um, you might want to think of it that way. And then you might want to also think about and this is actually going to the third point, which is what they want. And this goes back to um, we discussed in editing, which is the reader experience. What does the reader want? Do they want an escape? Do they want a thrill ride? Do they want a sensual adventure? Do they want um, to be tickled? Do they want to be shocked? Do they want to be confronted? Right? There are all kinds of experiences. Um, if I'm going to give you an example, um, so in my statement, I'm just going to give you the full statement, which you, which is I write, um, I write magical tales of romance, mystery, and adventure, which is how I describe my genre, for women and girls. Um, to empower them to be the heroes of their own lives. And this notion of being the heroes of their own lives kind of, for me, kind of falls into their secret wish, right? Because when we are yeah. writing, I write these action adventure heroines. So when you get to step into them, you're, you get to do it too. You're like, dun, 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 right? We get to be the female Indiana Jones and the female James Bond and, if you, and Wonder Woman or, you know, whatever those archetypes are. So what is the experience your reader craves, wants, out of your kind of genre? Does that make sense? Mm, definitely. Okay. All right, I see you guys writing. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've been writing mine as we, as we, uh, okay. as we were chatting there. So, yeah, that's good. I like that. Yeah, and um, great. Are you guys ready to give me yours? Uh, I am, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Are they just still writing away? Yeah, I need yeah. like two or three more words. So you go ahead, Robert. <laughs> okay, Robert, you go first. Yeah, um, I would say that um, my reader, I mean, like many authors, I suppose, you, you probably start out writing for yourself the story that you'd love to read, which is nothing wrong with that. So in, in a way, I feel like I'm sort of defining what I like about futuristic sci-fi action adventure. Um, so... An intellectually curious lover of gasping moments, um, probably 30 plus, um, but that doesn't preclude obviously young readers, but I would imagine that it's a 50-50 male-female mix from what I can gather from readers in my, uh, you know, who, who subscribe. Um, they want to be stimulated brain-wise, but with an escape and not just, you know, sword slashing or, or um, you know, um, lightsaber stuff, but have something meaningful behind it. Um, and rapid-fire dialogue. So there's a, there's a lot in there. It's a bit sort of packed. So it's not just it's not just the science or the stimulation on that, but it's the rapid-fire dialogue that, that brings it to life in a particular voice. StoryWorks Reading Series is a new sister podcast to StoryWorks Roundtable. It is a literary journal for your ears. 
the podcast that gives voice to your story and you. I want your short stories and lyric essays now. Details at storyworkspodcast.com slash submit. And there was something just occurred to me. When, oh, the, yes. Um, I, I love the impact of, and you sort of spoke to it a little bit with yours, where you were talking about before, it might have been the previous episode, where we were talking about um, things that are futuristic, where you're doing, you're solving a murder mystery, but you're solving with, with future tech. And so that has to twist your mind a bit. And I always love what the classic sci-fi readers would do to twist our thoughts about how society might be if one technological development changed the way we did things. Um, so I particularly like that. I haven't been brilliantly successful at writing it, but that's definitely rare. That's, that for me would be a purpose. That's still the thing that's driving me is I'd love to write the story that shifts, that, that has something in it and a nugget in it that shifts how society turns. Um, but within that, then there's an action adventure plot. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. I love that shift society turns and you've got so many wonderful things there and, um, I hope you wrote them all down because in the end I'm going to, um, yeah, we're going to hone in on like the most powerful bit because we don't need right. to tell the reader all of this in this one sentence. We can just tell them like, so I would ask you, Robert, if you could circle or underline which of these things that you wrote down are like the most important, or maybe you have to figure out the top five and then go down to top three and then choose the top one. <laughs> well, probably you know. the intellectually intellectual gasps, I think, if I could sort of pack it into something yeah. that I had to unpack, I would know what that meant. I would be able to explain that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that's very, you've done again, you've put two things together that don't normally go together and that is fun and surprising, mm. which tells yeah. something about what you're up to as an author as well. Right. Like you you know when we're gonna read Robert's work, he's gonna do some fun, he's gonna put some things together we hadn't seen before and make us go, oh, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah. I love how in going yeah. through this process, even if the end result ends up being this sort of brilliant marketing package, this nugget that we can, you know, deliver on on the escalator, you said when we were talking earlier that through the process of playing and exploring, Robert came up with something that is his driver for writing that finding that one thing upon which the whole world turns, and within that having the action adventure storyline. So we're, we're, doing at least double duty here, if not more duties. <laughs> For sure. That is so cool. Yeah, I really like honing in on the one thing that drives you and then might also captivate a reader. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would say, too, that that's one of the most fascinating things about science fiction. When I read Dune when I was in college, I was like, oh, my goodness, yes. how everything turned on, on the specific elements, but also how I got a whole new perspective on society because yes. of that book that series yeah Mm. um wow wonderful how about you alita okay so my readers want a richly woven narrative exploring the dark undercurrent of everyday life in america's past oh wonderful i love that and what really stood out for me was the dark undercurrent of Mm. everyday life that is just so juxtaposition (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I can really, that speaks to readers. Readers go for that. I, I, readers will tell me, oh, give me, yeah, they want that. And um, eventually in your final statement, you probably don't need to repeat past because you're going to have that. You're mm-hmm. going to tell readers about the past in your genre description. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's even can translate. One of the uses of this statement is it can help you find your tagline. That can that can be like on your website or your social media yes. or a business card or mar- any marketing thing, and and this what did you say the dark underpinning of everyday life? Dark undercurrent of everyday life. Mm-hmm. So you could even say on your website tales of the dark undercurrent of everyday life, or historical tales or, or something whatever have we right. want to you know 
make up your genre. Oh, that's so, so evocative. And I know exactly what you're up to <laughs> and what you're probably obsessed about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's so cool. There's that North and, Star, right? You find your obsession oh my, and there's yeah. your North Star. <laughs> Point North. Go. <laughs> Go. And also it points to, for both of you and for me too, it points to our potential audiences like I could see for you Alita that your audience would love um, true crime true crime podcasts right true crime stories books movies all that right I could just see like ooh, mm. and then true crime about the past like the Black Dahlia you know, what is it the Dahlia Black Dahlia I think the LA story yeah or you know those big intense stories from the past and how people who are really obsessed with that history would probably love your fiction so it's also a way to try and figure out where does your market where's your market already paying attention um wow yeah wow yeah. thank you gosh <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't put that's those dots together before yeah, that's that awesome very interesting yeah in terms of <laughs> yeah. crossover audience there as well because as you were talking and um, beth was thinking about the leader and the you know, the idea of the haunted house and tracing back to you know a centuries old murder that then becomes a cold case that has to be you know explored in a kind of true crime sense and that's i mean i've written plenty of book descriptions for for books like that so that definitely exists so you, you can mm -hmm. see that okay so that's an audience there that's an audience that's there's so many people yeah the murder in Skog Hall. That's one of my books yeah, exactly. is the, the haunted house with the cold case ghost. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, great. Well, there's one more component to this yep. four piece sentence, and I call it your impact upon the reader. So this is where you have a mission. And this is represented by the verb, the strong verb in your sentence. And in my case, it's to empower. Like, I want to empower my readers. My readers want to be the hero of their own lives. That's their reader experience. But I want to empower them. Or if I can do it from memory, my husband's is, let's see, he writes hard-boiled, kosher thrillers to, to, um, forget, to challenge uh, young adults seeking um, their Jewish heritage, mm. something like that. He really is doing that in his books, and it's funny, and it's challenging, a little confronting, and, you know, it's a thriller. So you can confront your readers. You can seduce your readers. You can uh, thrill your readers. Um, I encourage you to push beyond the cliché, like a lot of romance readers will say, well, I want to, um, I want to, th yeah, thrill. I mean, thrill's good. See if you can brainstorm a few verbs that encapsulate what do you wish for your readers like for you Robert it feels like there's this wonderful there's something playful about what you're doing Definitely. and challenging Definitely it's like playful, playful. Yeah. you know do you want to challenge them or do you want to um, provoke them almost like into a new way of experiencing reality um, um, some readers want to, so when some people say, well, I want to inform, like some nonfiction writers, I want to inform, yeah. well, yes, that's a given. So what else beyond the given? Yeah. Um, chill your readers. Um, intoxicate, like see if you can reach for the powerful, interesting verb. Yeah, 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 the packed verbs, yeah. That's, ooh, that, I can see why you'd go first draft <laughs> <laughs> yes, and revise, revise. <laughs> brainstorm, brainstorm. Yeah, wow. Get the thesaurus out. Thesaurus <laughs> out, yeah. And I realized I wanted to give you guys examples. So I'm going to call up my article here. Just a few more examples for you while you guys brainstorm at home. So we have inspire, motivate, transport, challenge, invite. Uh, we already did thrill to awaken the soul, ignite, mm. feel rapture. 
There's lots, isn't there? Eh? In, in all those wonderful power words, enlightened. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, surprise, stun. Hmm. Ooh. Ooh, I like the stun. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. It's, it's one of those. What do they call those words? Oh, I keep feeling the technical term for that. They have the diametrically opposed meaning. So to stun can mean to be delighted, uh, and to stun can mean to knock someone out. You know, so. Yes, yes. I don't remember the technical word. Yeah, that's no. so fine. Yeah. Mm. Sure. Yeah, I'm close to mine anyway. I think. Well, at least with rough okay. drafts. Are you yeah. Sure. yeah. We can. What do you What do you have? Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. So the impact on the reader um, to take their breath away by being playfully provocative with brain spinning adventures. Brain spinning adventures. Oh my god, that's almost like a genre appellation right there. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. And I'm wondering how. Um, can you read them to me again? Take their breath away by being play playfully provocative with brain spinning adventures. Hmm. Which is a bit of a, bit of a mouthful, okay. but obviously, first draft. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, interesting, very interesting. Yeah, you kind of actually renamed your, your, your genre, mm. brain splitting adventures. Mm. <laughs> that makes me laugh, that makes me gasp, that makes me want to go, what? show me more you know like that's so it shows your playfulness and you're also the intellectual game that yeah. you're inviting us into yeah. and, and that's very attractive for those of us who love sci-fi yeah like uh, that some speculative style yeah mm -hmm. really fun is your stuff akin to hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy at all um not in not as sarcastic sort of uh no, I mean I love that. I, I, my my, in terms of sci-fi comedy, my ongoing love has always been Red Dwarf. I don't know if you've ever watched any Red Dwarf. Um, uh, I've heard, of, I've, I've seen some clips, and I, I think my husband is a fan, but I haven't, I haven't. So there's a little it, it, bit of the British, absurd. very British. Yeah, yeah. British. It's a, yeah, so absurd. Yeah, definitely, they are very absurd. There, it's uh, yeah. I won't even go into the premise. It's it's hilarious. Yeah. But that <laughs> but that was one of the things that I used to watch. And I, I, how I'd love to be able to write this. That's the thing that I said. I, you know, and I, and I had no idea that I would actually end up trying one day. Um, so yes, I do like humour, but I'd like it's, it's definitely the the breathtaking adventure part of it. But all, would always trump humour for me, I think. Mm -hmm. But but yes, if there was no humour, if there was nothing playful, then I would find, I find it a very dull book. <laughs> Absolutely. And there may be that there are people who like the absurd sci-fi kind of, that's why I think of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in its broadest sense is this absurd kind yes. of futuristic, playful thing. So in that way, it feels like, I'm just wondering, since I haven't read your work, if it fits alongside, like it's a different kind of absurd, it's a different kind of humor, it's a different, but still we know when we're going to come into your adventures that we're going to get some of that. Um, and I Not think, at the moment. It's it's buried. Okay. It's probably buried in the voice. Okay. But I'd say that that's um, that's still a thing undone. So okay. yeah, yeah. I think okay, that's, that's, that's what that's, you're you definitely hit on something. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, oh, cool. We're going to come back to you. Yeah, and, and maybe <laughs> start to. So I'm going to encourage you, Robert, to see if you can start to put this together in one sentence. You've got a lot yeah. of words, maybe. And the sentences to aim. I think they're about. 25 words ultimately right. you want to end up with something that is super easy to say the best storytellers move their readers whether to laughter tears or some other point on the spectrum of human emotion in order to write emotionally evocative sensory rich compelling narratives we must mine our wellspring of personal experience using the storyteller's first set of tools our memory, emotion, and body. New live workshop starting very soon is available for enrollment right now. Memory, Emotion, Body is a four-week generative workshopping intensive experience to help you understand how to write, 
from your core. Sign up today at storyworksfiction.com. Um, cool. So, Alita, how about you? What do you have? Okay, you so I have three verbs. I'm not sure if any of them is the final verb, but okay. uh, compel readers to confront the shadows of life by immersing them in a historical experience. Ooh. I loved out of those confront really stood out as the most. So you might want to see if you can, um, yeah, use that. Okay. The first one is what? what compel. Was before? Compel. Yeah. Yeah, compel almost felt like uh, too much. But confront, okay. I think readers step into true crime to be confronted and to mm. to kind of to put, I guess, another idea I see. We like, they like true crime because it puts it front and center, uh -huh. right? The, the misdeeds and the darknesses and everything. Right. Um, I don't know, play, play with that and maybe maybe the others. But I think if I were to choose one, I would choose Confront. Okay. I think it, but also, just to remind you guys and everybody listening that we really want to test these out on our readers, too. Yeah, yeah. Our readers and our unsuspecting loved ones who live with us <laughs> and <laughs> our fellow writers and... Uh, to really uh, see how they land and also see how it feels to speak them. Um, yes. So, yeah. Do you, um, Robert, have like a, a now we want to, so the final step of after we've addressed your genre, your reader, the reader's experience and your, your impact upon the reader in this one powerful verb, we now want to construct a sentence. And the sentence can be in any order, but generally readers expect to hear your genre first. So when you, when says, someone asks you, oh, so Robert, what do you write? Yeah. You know, what, what would you say? Yeah, well, that's exactly what I've done, actually. It's started with the genre. So I've come up with futuristic adventures with brain-spinning twists to provoke you into playful new worlds. Yes! Two arms yeah. up with fists <laughs> in the air. Yes, because, oh my gosh. I, can you say it one more time? Yes. Futuristic adventures with brain spinning twists to provoke you into playful new worlds. Wow. I'm already there. Like, yeah. Very interesting. I like it. What, um, and that probably would fit with what I currently write, but it would also allow for that future comedic, um, because it's still got the playful twisted part of it in there, brain spinning. So I think it would encompass both. Yeah, and I would play also with can you shorten it just a yeah. little? Yes. Because you have some modifies, modifiers after you yeah. shoot. Yeah. Thinking, eh, maybe we don't need that because you kind of fulfill that at the end. So if you can you take away that, you know what I'm talking about? Futuristic adventures with provocative brain sparring twists into playful new worlds. Um, uh, yeah, I can, I can definitely. Say, say your genre again. Futuristic adventures. Okay. And then say your verb. Uh, brain spinning twists. No, no, to provoke you. It's the provoke, provoke. is the verb. Yeah. So futuristic adventures to provoke you. And what's the last part? Yeah, into playful new worlds. To playful new worlds. That's how I would shorten it. Yeah, take out the brain uh, spinning I, twists, yeah. Yeah, I don't think you need Because you, you imply that with the provoke, don't you, I suppose? Exactly, hmm. yeah. yeah. Something to play with. I would say test yeah, yeah, it definitely. on the yeah, yeah. ten more times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you might rearrange some things, and who knows? You know, I, but I, I feel like it is, and you guys listening at home, you're going to, you know, tell Robert, what do you think? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Great, good I'm job. Say, I've read his stuff, it's rubbish, it's nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> unlikely, <laughs> highly unlikely. <laughs> and, and your readers might even come back at you and say, that's great, and they might talk to you. This is what's also useful. People might tell other people like, oh, gosh, you gotta read Robert, he writes, what is your full name, I'm sorry? Scanlon, S-C-A-N-L-O-N. <laughs> Robert Scanlon writes futuristic adventures, brain splitting, provocative. Oh my God, you got to read it. Right? They'll start to use your language in yeah. how they talk about you and in the book yeah. reviews. And that's how you know it's landed on their side because they start telling it you. <laughs> that's yeah. what you write. Mm. <laughs> it's so cool. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Yes. Alina, how cool. about you? 
Okay. All right. I've got 21 words, I think. <laughs> uh, I write historical Midwestern Gothic tales that immerse readers in a richly woven narrative confronting the dark undercurrent of everyday life. Oh, my God. Yes. Mm -hmm. The dark undercurrent of everyday life. Oh, so dark. Yes. Wonderful. And, and I, I got to use two verbs, immerse and confront. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to challenge you a little bit to okay. the immerse part. Because that's okay. kind of understood, that whole phrase around immerse, because it we understand that, that right? That's what we already do in our fiction. Okay. What would it sound like if you took that phrase away? Uh, I write historical Midwestern Gothic tales that confront the dark undercurrent of everyday life. I love that. Yeah. I like it. I love okay. That. So what about, let me just yeah. throw a question at you now. So the thing I like about richly woven narrative is that it points toward my literary voice, my style of writing prose, as opposed to being other subgenres of historical fiction. So would that be an argument to leave that in or, you know? You could test it with your readers. I feel like it, I'm or it's already a given because you use four words to describe your genre. Exactly. Okay. Right. Yeah. The there you go. Open yeah. And, and also, and my books are long. There, Can you tell? <laughs> there's an implication there with the um, uh, the dark undercurrents. So mm -hmm. you know you're not you're not saying uh, the bloody stabbings. You're saying dark undercurrents. So that in and, of, right. in and of itself is a literary expression, really. Yeah. Oh, nice. Particularly when you marry it with the historical and the and and the Midwest, you know, you, you, all of it together, I think, is is giving a. Um, uh, can't remember the name for it now, but anyway, Gestalt. That's it. Yeah, Gestalt. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. You got, yeah, you have conveyed the richly woven nature of your writing, um, and then I also want to say instead of that confront to confront yes mm. so it, it changes it gives a little more punch it's a uh, verb and active presence thank you so yeah. tales to confront the dark undercurrent of everyday life yes okay and the language itself confronts us is confronting which is perfect because <laughs> that's exactly the experience you the author want mm -hmm. to give the reader yeah oh my god and i think you have said so well in the four words of your genre, like what you are inviting people into. It is so rich and so specific. I think your readers who are like a yes for that, I'm going to go, oh, my God, but I have to read this. That's what we want, right? We want right. to go, oh, my God, I can read it. Where's the book? Where can I buy it? Those yeah. people literally say that to me when I tell them what I write. Where can I buy your book? That's, that's yeah. perfect, right? Oh, awesome. That's really the end goal. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah. You've got me excited about my my books now. Like I'm having that reaction to this statement because I've never distilled it down into words like this in such a <coughs> precise way that that uses evocative language. You know, I know I write historical fiction. I know I have a literary voice. I know my tales have a dark side to them. I know, but to to actually craft the language into a single statement that you know, evokes excitement. That's really cool. <laughs> oh my God, that is gold. That is gold. I'm so excited for you. It's so wonderful. And and what's wonderful about that is that excitement is also oriented toward the reader, right? And we're like, oh, I want, I want to tell my readers about this. You know, because I devised this whole thing because I noticed read, writers' reluctance to market. You know, just mm -hmm. the word market would make them like break out in hives and run in the other direction. And I wanted to show them, because I had gotten this sales training, I'm like, no, it's an invitation. How can we invite our readers in? How can we tell them exactly what flavor of ice cream we have on tap for them, you know? So they're like, Rocky Road with walnuts? Sign me up, right? It's, mm -hmm. we really, it's really about inviting people into the experience and, and making that yummy and delicious in all the right ways that, you know, show off exactly what you're offering them. And and then it's then it's a yes, or then it's oh I don't read that, but my neighbor reads that, or mm. oh my mom reads that, or my sister reads that, or my teen Henrietta the Dragon Slayer, oh my teen daughter, that can a twelve year old read your book? I'm like yes, you know, like right. it's 
it's and engages goes allows us to go to the next level, which is you know buy my book or sign up for my mailing list or check out my freebie or or check out the excerpt or visit mm-hmm. my site for freebies. Right then we go into the call to action yeah. after we get their response. So it really is the beginning of the whole marketing effort, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Um, yeah, and, and I'll go back to my iceberg analogy as well because I think that's the external expression and. The challenge I think we're often given in in the indie world with the external expression is, you know, come up with sales lines or, you know, people say, what do you write? So I write science fiction. Oh, and they say, what kind of science fiction? You know, and so what you're you're using is a way to to express that more fully. Underneath that, my sense of it is particularly noticing my own enthusiasm and the leader's enthusiasm and and, um, identification with it. And if you look at the word identification, we're, we're really saying this is my identity as an author um, and I, I know that's something I struggled with for a long time because I didn't believe that it was possible for me um, so I wasn't even motivated to even try because I just assumed it was something other people did because they were brilliant um, and I remember a time in a different career where I was um, becoming as right at the start of my career as a corporate trainer um, and a corporate consultant and I, I felt like a fraud the first year um, and I can remember the exact instant when I was thinking about NLP and identity. Um, and I was walking around this a parked car, I was walking around a corner to meet with um, a client in the building of the people I was contracting to as well. So they were all, they were very important people, you know, sort of, you know, classic corporate building, all a bit flash. And I was just thinking, I'm going to go in there and they don't know that I'm just, I know nothing, I don't know anything, you know. So it's all this negative self talk. And I suddenly realized that I have to do this be as if I have to understand that I am that person now because otherwise I'll never be that person so I started to switch my identity well, how would I walk how would I think how would I talk if I were the person that they absolutely needed as their solution it changed my life completely uh, mm. it really did and I think this author statement you can see it as a marketing angle, and I don't disagree with you. I think it's, it's fantastic. It's the most authentic marketing angle you can have because it's going to resonate with your identity. And it then speaks back to your identity as an author. This is why I write. This is the sto- these are the types of stories that enthrall me, that enchant me, that captivate me. And therefore, this is my external expression of those, but there's nothing fake about that. You know, right. So it's one mm-hmm. way, I think, to deflect that imposter syndrome and to start to embrace the real identity, particularly one, I think, and I'm going on a bit, but particularly one about the independent world where we can be, we, you know, we started out maybe as uh, with the trad world looking down their noses at us because we did go through the same formal processes maybe. Um, maybe different for both of you with more formal training. I've had no formal training whatsoever and I hated English at school. Um, you know, whereas a leader is on the other end of that. You know, she's done mm-hmm. the whole MFA thing. She's a professional development mm-hmm. editor. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I feel a little bit, you know, if I'm arguing grammar with her, I feel like, you're, oh, I don't know, <laughs> what would I know? I failed English. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, so, yeah, you know, so I'm, I think it's a superb yeah. identity statement mm-hmm. as well. It is, and I love so what you're what you're saying, Robert, and tying it back to that idea of this statement as the North Star. You know, when Madeline yeah. emailed me to recommend Beth for the show, she called it a statement of purpose in her email, not not a marketing statement. And I knew her excitement about it was about this identity piece, about this North Star piece. And then that translates into exciting the readers, which is that yeah. core, the heart of being an effective marketer. Because then you aren't selling yourself, you're inviting that beautiful word Beth used, that this is an invitation <laughs> to readers to come yeah. share in our creation. Absolutely. I love that. And thank you again, Madeline. And, you know, I when I created it, I think I was just bridging without realizing between um, my reason for being or my, my you know, my reason, yeah, for, for, for being and translating that into how do I translate that into a short invitation to mm. engage others. And, um, and it started out in the business world. It started out about how do I explain what I do as this crazy creative coach who works with novelists and <laughs> great books. And, uh, you know, you're like, oh, how do I put it all together? And, and so it's very wonderful that we come back to that, like, and, and to really honor this as a statement of purpose. I love that. I'm going to start to bring that back into 
the curriculum. And it's almost, it's like I've always had to walk this line between self-reflection and know thyself with tactical, useful tools for writers. Mm -hmm. That's always been my interest, but it's almost always been like, I can't really sell I really, I started out my very first offering that didn't sell at all, like zero interest and zero feedback was intuitive writing. Nobody was interested in that, you know? And so I've actually had to learn to come out to the marketplace because I've been very always inner directed and very like, what's really going on? And, you know, all this inner focus and all of that. And I actually have a background in clairvoyant training and I come from this very, I'm like you, Robert, I do not come from, I don't have an MFA. I didn't major in English. And, you know, my teaching experience is teaching English to foreigners. That's how I started, which is actually a great way to learn English. <laughs> it's a very practical way to teach others how to use English and become fluent. So I come from this very tactical thing <laughs> and from customer experience, I mean, as a, as a front desk person in lots of different jobs. So I, my credentials are the School of Hard Knocks. And uh, I've learned the hard way, like, that's, that's actually totally legit. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it got, you know, it got me here. Um, right, right. Well, and even if people have an MFA, it doesn't count for much unless you put in your 10,000 hours, unless you're also attending oh, the school for hard knocks, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> school of hard knocks <laughs> alongside it. You know, yeah, seriously. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. you have to. Uh, no, but it can be intimidating. That's, that's what I was trying mm -hmm. to get across. Mm -hmm. you know, people have gone and, and yeah. spent all that time and money on study, in theory, should know an awful lot more than I do. Um, mm -hmm. And but like you say, Alita, that doesn't count for anything unless that theory is put into practice. Unless you, yes, exactly, yeah. practice. And I don't think I've ever made you cry, Robert. So I hope I'm not <laughs> too intimidating. <laughs> <you know? laughs> I think it's very really interesting that Beth has got a sort of a backdoor method there because. You know, as you, as you quite rightly say, um, people crave tactics. You know, they want the next shiny thing. So you can go out there and say, I will show you how to create the perfect marketing message for your voice, your books, and you as an author. And they'll go, oh, oh, really? But what it's about is about identity change. And you can't mm -hmm. sell that because people don't crave that. Yeah, um, you can't sell that. I even mm -hmm. it's self, even in my fi writing planning, I don't tell people you're working on core identity and beliefs. No, I'm just no. <laughs> <laughs> this exercise to help you get to know your character better. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Beth. This has been incredible. Uh, before we give people your link somewhere to find you, do you have any final words about this statement? Anything you want to add? Sure. Well, I really, really encourage everybody to practice this. Um, for a hands-on useful metric, I say practice it on 10 people. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, ideally practice it on more, you know, 20, 50, 100. Um, practice it online. Practice it with your bio on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or wherever. You know, practice how can you put it on your website. And then ask for feedback, right? So when I say practice it, I'm like, ask people, hey, what do you think of this? And, and just watch how people react and adjust accordingly. This is really a real world statement. This is not meant to sit in your notebook. This is really meant to be out in practice in the world representing mm -hmm. you and, and showing up for you. And, and so play it, play with it, workshop it. And then in the, in the, in the links, we'll, we'll give you an article that you can come in, which is just what we went through today. And you can post it in there in the comments and I will give you feedback um, because I can be one of your people. That you awesome. <laughs> wow, that's so generous. Everybody listening, get to work. Yes, yes. And besides posting your statement in the comments under Beth's article, come over to StoryWorks Writers Facebook group and share with us and share with each other there as well. Why not? Why not get feedback in two places? Start putting it into practice Absolutely. as many places as you can. Because we promise the leader won't make you cry. No, no, I'm really very nice, despite rumors. So, <laughs> all right, Beth, where can everybody find you? Uh, great, yes. Yeah, so people can jump into Writer's Fun Zone blog, um, which is where the article will be housed, and check out lots of articles for writers and resources, free a free book on how to generate ideas, as well as access to lots of audios I've made. 
Uh, and then if you want to see my classes, because this statement we did is part of the big, bigger class I have called Branding for Novelists, where I walk you through lots of other parts of being able to present yourself as a writer in the world. Uh, and that's at BaraniSchoolOfFiction.com. Fantastic. And if you missed any of those, we will have links in the show notes at StoryWorksPodcast.com as well. Thank you for listening to the StoryWorks Roundtable. Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at StoryWorksPodcast.com. <laughs>